co-host of Pax What She Said. Maggie, thank you for joining me today after, I guess, uh, a disastrous attempt <laughs> at Cheesehead TV Trivia. Nothing was working. So I thought, hell, let's just jump over here and talk some Packers. Talk the draft. Talk, talk this really unusual offseason. And maybe a little bit about what you have coming up on the podcast. So, you know, first of all, I don't think it's going to become a surprise to anybody who follows you on Twitter that uh, you have a very particular draft crush sitting there for the Packers <laughs> at the 30th overall pick. Who is it and what's your reasoning? I don't know if you have my video on, but uh, I, I do. Got on a, I, got on I hope so. <laughs> yeah, it says uh, Ross Blacklock, no matter what. So I love it. I love ever, it. Since, ever since I was a football fan, like from, I don't know, the time I started following, I've always been a huge fan of the defensive lineman picks. I have one that I always want to see in Green Bay every year. Um, maybe it has something to do with BJ Raji. I don't fully know. But <laughs> this year, this year it is Ross Blacklock out of Texas Christian University. I just... I think that he makes sense for the Packers. Kenny Clark needs some help on the interior. He's a nice two-gap run stuffer. Still needs to work on his pass rush. But when you have Kenny Clark next to you as your pass rusher, you don't really, you know, you don't got to do a hell of a lot. Well, that's my thing, too, because I see put the pushback to that usually is how much help they need on offense, which in a draft, as deeply stacked as this one is with wide receiver talent, I think they're okay not taking yeah. somebody at wide receiver at 30. I agree that it doesn't matter if his pass rush is NFL caliber, NFL ready, what have you. If he is taking up bodies specifically on early downs to allow Kenny Clark to get upfield, you know, because right. a lot of the time Kenny's the one who has to absorb those double teams. If you have another big body on there that commands two guys, not your Tyler Lancasters, not your Dean Lowry's, but a guy who's right. really a space eater. I think Kenny becomes a lot even more productive. And so do your edge rushers. You know, you like you hope, don't need right. to rely. You, yeah, you would hope. I talked to Perry about this a little bit, and she really likes AJ Epinesa, the edge rusher. Oh. And she's like, there's no way that the Packers at 30 are taking an edge rusher. But can you just imagine? Could they, though? Well, yeah, I mean, we always say this, like they would <laughs> never do that. But then uh, it's the Packers. You, know, you never know. They say I stocked mean, up on uh, corner. Once upon a time, maybe they stock up on edge this time around. I don't know. I, I doubt it, but you never know. I doubt it, but I like to think about it. I like to think about the possibilities of the Smiths, Gary, and Epinesa all uh, stunting from different angles. That'd be an interesting uh, remix going from uh, Kyler Fackrell at, at the th you know first <laughs> off the bench to Gary and Epinesa in the mix there. Uh, what do you think about Gary? I mean, a lot's been said, a lot's been written about his rookie year. You can call it a disappointment. You can call it incomplete. They certainly didn't get him on the field as much as we probably expected for a guy who was taken 12th overall. What's your feeling there? What, what do you expect to see from him coming into year two? To me, Rashawn Gary is very much TBD to be determined. I think that given where he kind of stepped in, I think he was the best player available for Brian Gutekunst at, and it arguably still was a position of need you don't necessarily want the Smiths to come in and then have Fackrell as your third guy. And it's not a knock on Fackrell. It's just saying the talent that they needed. They overhauled the entire position for a reason. So while Gary didn't take the snaps that we maybe thought that he would, this is a big year for him. And you hear Brian Gutekunst talk about him. You hear Mike Smith talk about him. And they rave about him, his work ethic, kind of the way that they see him stunting like Zedaria Smith on the outside or the inside. And it just he becomes a more dynamic piece for Mike Patton in year two. And I think that we need to give him the entire second season to see what that work will look like. And I know that. Are you talking patience when Packers what? fans? What? 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 I, I don't know about all that. I mean, you know, if he's not per, like, if he doesn't come out of the gate smoking hot, like I'm talking almost a sack a game, a bunch of pressures, etc. You know, there is going to be a very vocal minority declaring it the ultimate bust. I mean, there are already a few people there as we speak, but... I have um, a solution for you. What's that? Trade Rashawn Gary for TJ Watt. <laughs> Why do you hate me? Why do you hate me? Man, I said in our chat earlier, like, 
I'm going to be 85 years old, and there's going to be some Yahoo coming up to me at a grocery store in Wisconsin going, Yo, are you going to take a TJ Watt instead of Kevin King? It is such an ancient history. I am so over it. People just like you just say that stuff now <laughs> to get me going, to push my buttons. I am over it. I am beyond over it. I don't care. And look, Kevin King's a good player. He, he is. Had really, he had a good year last year. I'm very interested to see if they re-sign him. That's uh, after, yeah. after his fourth year, but and that kind of comes to another part, uh, another kind of piece of the puzzle when you talk about the Packers draft. Cornerback could be, I, wanna, I don't want to say a sneaky need because I think it's always a need in the NFL. Yeah. With teams that spread things out on offense, but I mean they they maybe bring back Tremont Williams if they don't find something in the draft that they like. But that's it was a thirty nine year old. You know, yeah. I think cornerback could be a, you know, not maybe not a significant need, but certainly a strong need in this draft. That's how it feels to me. It feels like Tremont is their safety valve, where if the guys they want aren't necessarily there on the first two days and they're unsure of whether or not a day three pick can make that necessary jump. Josh Jackson hasn't taken the jump. Chandon Sullivan looks good, but I'm not sure he's somebody that you want to give Tremont William played 73% of snaps for this defense. So I don't know if he's 38 years old. Right. I don't know if you want to give all those snaps away to still unproven players. But, you know, when Kevin King is healthy, and he did prove to be healthy for almost all of the 2019 season, led the team in interceptions, looks good. But behind Jair and Kevin, everything is very unproven. And if they take another guy early, I don't know. I mean, I get the reticence from fans because of the fact that they – have spent so much draft capital at that position mm-hmm. recently. I mean, so often. Uh, to me, I, I think a big wild card is Kadar Holman, you know, the fifth yes. round pick from last year. He looked great in camp. He, he did. He looked like a real sticky man corner, something that, you know, uh, they've always liked in Green Bay. They certainly need it when they go to those man looks. But yeah, the, obviously, the Packers are the only ones who know what they have there because he right. never, I mean, he. I barely saw the field his rookie year. But if they expect him to develop and they think they like what they have there, then maybe corner doesn't become such a pressing issue. To me, because it's like, I think we saw what we, we saw definite uh, improvement slash development from Chandon Sullivan throughout the year. Yes. I do not doubt for a second that if Kadar can come in and contribute, then okay, maybe corner is going to be all right. But I'm with you. If, If there's a guy there talented who's a, represents a value in whatever round, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see a selection earlier on in the draft. W- what do you think about um, Matt LaFleur and Aaron Rodgers going into year two offensively without much of an off season? You have to think, I mean, yeah. they're still going to be working this out for the next kind of month or so. OTAs, mini camp, you have to think those are completely off the table at this point. Uh, we remember what happened in 2011 after the lockout. They really hit the ground running offensively. Do you think they can do that in a different offense with a group that hasn't worked together as much with a lot of inexperience, you would presume, at wide receiver? I feel like the trickiest part is going to be for all of these draft picks. So assuming the Packers take a wide receiver, even at pick 62, how do you build chemistry with somebody through a Zoom meeting? You know, like that's <laughs> kind of right. going to be the issue here for for a lot of these players is – Yes, they can get on the same page with Aaron theoretically, and once right. they practice, maybe it'll be kind of a seamless transition. But I think that's the piece that's missing. I think that the offense is ready to take a step going into now year two, and I think that you know Matt Lafleur, Brian Gutekunst, Aaron Rodgers, everybody's made the comparison to what Lafleur has or did in Atlanta with Matt Ryan. So right. the expectation is really high for the offense. I don't necessarily think that there's going to be a drop off. I think that there's a lot that they can do to continue improving. But I I do think that there is a challenge with all these young guys, whether it's a running back, a tight end, wide receiver, tight end is one of the hardest transitions to make in the NFL. And if you take a day three tight end and try and teach him a brand new offensive scheme with blocking and it's, it's going to be rough at least the first like four weeks of the season. It was funny though. I talked to Jay Sternberger on my podcast yesterday and he, I asked him about that transition because it is like, you know, pretty much the toughest uh, jump as far as what's asked of you. He yeah. had a great answer where he said it, it was just great to be able to finally do the stuff I did in practice, like actually on the field, because he said in college yeah. they were taught everything at tight end, but they mm-hmm. rarely, if ever, translated to actual 
calls during either practice or games. So he said he got to the NFL and it's like, oh, wait, we actually get to do all this now. So <laughs> it's expected of you to just step in and know it. No doubt about it. All right, Maggie, uh, I can't thank you enough for joining me. Uh, tell the fine folks where to find you on Twitter, online in general. And uh, again, what the, the podcast is all about. All right. So you can find me on Twitter at Maggie J. Loney, L-O-N-E-Y. I write two articles a week for Cheesehead TV. I podcast with the Pack a Day podcast crew. And I also have a new show with Perry Goldstein. We're already on 10 episodes, so I guess I can't keep calling it a new show. But we have, <laughs> we have the, the Packs, what she said, podcast on Twitter at PWSS podcast. This week, we're talking about first round draft picks for all of the Packers 2020 opponents. So give us a follow and a listen and... Say hey on Twitter if you follow me. Awesome. Maggie, thanks so much for the time, and I'll uh, talk to you online. Yeah, go Pack Go.